Good afternoon. I'm Jan Kregel, and I'm closing up, which means that I now have 35 minutes no. to smoke. <laughs> <laughs> to try and summarize what, uh, what we've been talking about, and I'll try and do this by concentrating on what I think are the two lessons that we should have learned from the crisis. Perhaps we've, some people have learned them, a number of people have not. The first is that we looked upon the crisis or the resolution of the crisis initially as a micro problem. That is, we looked basically at financial regulation as trying to create the solidity of individual, individual banks. And then we discovered that, in fact, all of these banks were interconnected amongst themselves. <coughs> Lehman went down and the entire financial system went down. So we had the problem of inter interconnectivity, we can call it. The second was that after Lehman went down, my goodness, this financial system was also interconnected with the rest of the economy. <laughs> and more or less instantaneously, the rest of the economy <laughs> went down. So the basic point of complexity, I think, translates into something that Mariana already mentioned. And this is the necessity of having communication or compatibility or policy creation across different ministries. Maybe the people who are responsible for innovation and the people who are responsible for fiscal policy and the people who are responsible for employment policy should be talking to each other mm -hmm. because facing the financial crisis is not just the problem of the central bank or the treasury. I've just come from a G20 conference on employment and the main theme of that conference was the necessity of looking at employment in the context of generalized macroeconomic monetary and fiscal policies. Now, I'm not a great fan of the G20, <laughs> but the idea that was brought up that the, what Naira said, that the international institutions sometimes have an impact on national discussions. This is the kind of impact, I think, which would be very important. I don't think the G20 is very useful in setting up standards and codes that apply to all countries. In fact, I'm very much against this. But at the same time, if, if it can serve as a mechanism of creating new ways of approaching problems, and in particular, of putting forward the idea that all of these ministries and ministers and policies should in fact be coordinated because that's what the financial crisis taught us in fact should happen, should be a very useful, a very useful service. The second is in terms of the response to the crisis. Okay, we responded to the crisis by doing what? By saying, well, we have to rescue the financial system because if we don't rescue the financial system, the world is going to come to an end. And well, the world had already come to an end. We rescued the financial system because we thought the banks were going to lend again. This was the lead motif. We have to get them in a position where they're going to lend again. Well, newsflash, the banks weren't lending even before the crisis. <laughs> That's what securitization was all about. That was getting the banks out of the lending business. They were not doing the lending. They were simply doing the packaging, okay? They were doing the selling. They were doing the PR. They had become PR institutions. Now, if we look at what banks are supposed to be doing or the traditional explanation of why we have banks, it's because, well, me as a stupid saver, I don't know enough about the places I can invest. So I give my money to a banker because the bank is supposed to have better information. It's a problem of asymmetric information. The bankers know better where to invest. They do due diligence. Well, we've just discovered, if you've read the statement of fact of the U.S. Justice Department in the case against J.P. Morgan Chase, that J.P. Morgan Chase, yes, did do due diligence, but they outsourced it <laughs> to independent private firms. And when the independent private firms told them that large proportions of the mortgages that they were securitizing were not suitable. They ignored the advice. 
So on that case, you know, why should banks exist if they don't do what they're supposed to do? And this is the prima facie case for the idea of reforming the way the banks operate, not in saving the banks themselves, because they're never going to start lending again. And this is what, in fact, we have observed. Everybody looks and says, well, gosh, we've bailed out the banks, but they're not doing any lending. Okay? Now, the second part of this bailout was the concentration on the banks. Now, as Randy has already said, Minsky's basic idea of anal analyzing the economic system was looking at assets and liabilities. Okay? The banks had all of these lousy assets. The liabilities, who had them? They were the people holding the mortgages. They were the people whose houses went underwater. They were the people who eventually lost their jobs <coughs> when we had the collapse. And the basic lesson and the characteristic of the current crisis is that, in fact, we don't have a problem of restoring growth. Excuse me, Mariana. We have a problem of restoring employment. Mm -hmm. It's employment, stupid, not growth or anything else. The characteristic of the response to the crisis is, yes, we've managed to save the banks, we've managed to get some modicum of stagnation growth, but it's, un it's employment that is not growing. And this is the basic problem that we have to solve, and this was the big mistake that we made in responding to the crisis. How do you validate the assets that the banks are holding? Well, you make it possible for the people who have made those commitments to meet those commitments. And you don't do that by making them lose their jobs and by not providing a means of regenerating employment. So if we look at the idea of the regulations, now we have Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank does what? It protects the taxpayer from the failure of the banks who are never going to lend again. Now, I find this very strange because when I'm unemployed, I don't pay taxes. If I'm unemployed, why do I need to be protected against the banks? They've already done their damage to me. So that the kind of regulation we have basically should be regulation that is centered on recreating employment in the system, a system that generates employment. Now, here there are two basic principles, again, coming from Minsky. One, the banking system, as Randy has said, has to provide a sound and a safe payment system. And we'll come to that payment system in a minute. But secondly, the banks also have to finance initiatives that fail. Why? Because we don't have perfect foresight. We don't know which innovations are, in fact, going to succeed. It is the responsibility of bankers to take risks that don't pan out. Because if they don't do it, we'll never know which innovations are, in fact, the ones that are going to provide employment and to provide growth. Now, if we look at this basic idea of the safe and sound payment system, Randy has already suggested that this is something that you can't leave to the private sector. Well, the problem is that you can't leave it either just to the public sector. Why? Because if you look at the way payment systems are set up, virtually every government in the world has a constitution which says that the government is responsible for providing currency and coin. It is a public responsibility. Okay? The payment system that's provided by the banks is a private payment system. Okay? The state cedes to private financial institutions the right to provide that payments mechanism, just as the kings of England used to farm taxes. It is a right that is given, and a right that is given against regulation. So there is a prima facie case, number one, that the payment system is going to be a public-private system, and that the government should, in fact, be willing to regulate it. Now, if we go back to the problem of protecting ourselves from the banks, the basic problem is what? Well, they're too big and they're too interconnected and they benefit from that thing which is called deposit insurance, <coughs> which is the basis of the idea that we socialize the risks and we privatize the gains. Provocative proposal, Hyman Minsky says, get rid of deposit insurance. If you want to solve the problem, get rid of deposit insurance. 
Now, what does that mean? It means that the payments mechanism, the basic payments mechanism, will be a publicly provided mechanism. Okay? Banks are not going to do it. How are the banks going to make money? They're going to make money by lending to the non-financial business sector to take risks. Now, we've just heard that they're unwilling to take risks in general. This is why we need this long-term patient investments. But we could solve part of that problem by providing or shifting the deposit insurance from the insuring of deposits to the insuring of risky loans. Okay? Get rid of the support to take unnecessary risks and insure those loans that provide the support for innovation. Sounds a little bit like directed finance. Yes, it does. We used to do that. There was nothing wrong with it. Number two, the buzzword around the world today are PPPs. What are PPPs? Public-private partnerships in which governments take contingent liabilities on private investments. Now, what's the difference between that and providing insurance to investments by banks? Now, Mariana wants to shut me out here, <laughs> and <laughs> she's hit it just in time because I've now come to the end of my little note sheet. Thank you.